What's up, everybody, and welcome back to TarHillIllustrated.com, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm TSI staff writer Jacob Turner, and joining me as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, we're here for another episode of our top 25 UNC basketball players of all time series, which we've been rolling out over the past couple weeks, doing numbers 13 through 8 on this edition of it. But before we dive in to those guys who made the cut on this list, we've got a great promo going on our website, tarhillillustrated.com, that if you haven't heard about, you should definitely take advantage of. Use the promo code VISITS2021 to get free premium access to our site through August 10th, 2021. All you have to do is sign up before July 1st in order to do so. And with the amount of recruiting content we've got going on right now between football and basketball, it's a great time to be a part of it. 90% of the stuff that we do recruiting-wise or post-recruiting-wise is either on the premium boards or in a premium article that you have obviously have to be signed up as a premium member to access. So once this video is over, go below. You'll see it right there at the top. You can find a link to our website that'll take you right over there where you can go sign up for free through August 10th, 2021. Like I said, just do it before July 1st. But AJ, enough of the of the plugs, which if you're a full-time listener at Tar Illustrated and you follow all our videos, you've definitely heard quite a few over the past few months, but you know, it's a great opportunity. We got to keep blasting it so people can sign up and, and take advantage ahead of this season as well. But enough of that, let's dive in to this list. We're going to start with number 13, Bobby Lewis, a four that played at Carolina from 1964 through 1967 going to run through some of his accolades like I always do and then I'll kick it to AJ to to let you know why he chose to put Bobby at this position at 13 two-time All-American in 96 or excuse me in 66 and 67 um three-time All-ACC member NCAA East Region most valuable player in 67 first team All-ACC tournament team in 1967 as well AJ I mean Bobby Lewis a guy that played back in the 60s way before my time um, but when you look at the accolades that he's done, he's definitely a guy I've, I've uh, seen very, very minimal highlights on in my in trying to find some research and, and even photos as well. It's, there it's aren't many of the guys from back then. It's tough, man. It, it, I'm surfing the web trying to find images for these guys. Trust me, I, I've been all over it trying to do it. There's not a lot to look at. But for what I know about Bobby Lewis, when it, when it comes to what he did in his era, which is a big part of what we consider in these rankings, because we have to – it doesn't matter if it happened 10, 15, 20 years ago or, you know, 60 70 years ago like here what they did in their era is what's most important and you talk about a guy like Bobby Lewis at Carolina I mean that's a pretty impressive list right there of accomplishments so why did he make the list at 13 for you well he's the second they have the second highest single season scoring average ever 27.4 points in 1966 still holds a single game record at Carolina for most points in the game 49 against Florida State in 65 but really when you think about it he was just an unbelievable scorer uh, a guy who could score myriad ways, uh, who, who was very prolific. You know, back when he played, freshmen were ineligible. They had the freshman team. And I've heard stories, including one that Peter, the great Peter Gammons, legendary baseball writer who went to Carolina, uh, tweeted about watching Bobby Lewis as a freshman, you know, dominate guys like uh, Bob Verga from uh, Duke and, and, and uh, Pete Maravich and guys like that. So uh, he was, and he was also the period that he was at Carolina. There was Dean Smith hanging in effigy after that game at Wake Forest. And then a few years later, they started a three-year run of getting to the final four. And let's remember, you could only get to the NCAA tournament back then if you won your conference tournament in the ACC. Mm -hmm. So they, they won the 67 ACC tournament, which was Lewis's senior year. He's the player uh, MVP of the regional. They get to the final four. That was the first of three straight final fours for Carolina and Dean during that period. And that's really what launched the program into the wave that it has continued now 54 years later. So Bobby Lewis was an integral part of that. Guys like Lewis and, and, and Billy Cunningham and some of them during that period, they were De some of Dean's first great players. And they were extremely important. Uh, Lewis from a recruiting standpoint because of where he came from and certainly Cunningham as well. But, um, but Lewis was in that transitional period that Carolina went from not knowing what it was going to do with Smith where he was burning an effigy to where North Carolina suddenly exploded on the national scene, found a perch, and stayed there. 
and is we're covering background rebuilding North Carolina football. The pride that the Chaz Surratt's and the Michael Carters have had of being there. They were at the tail end of when Carolina was falling apart under Larry Fedora. And then being there when the big growth, when the eruption began, is huge. They took a lot of pride in that. Bobby Lewis was a comparable figure for Carolina basketball back then. Uh, and even more so because he was he's one of the greatest scorers in program history. But what we're doing in these bios, we list all that stuff. We list a ton of the stats and where they rank. And you know, a lot of Carolina fans may not know who Bobby Lewis was, especially if you're, you know, under the age of 45, maybe. Look at the numbers, look at the bio that we put there. The mm -hmm. dude could flat out play the game. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the era too, because that's important. I mean, it's huge for Carolina, you know, getting to where it is now and being one of the most successful programs in the history of college basketball. You know, he was a kind of a trailblazer in that respect of getting them to that mark, which, like you mentioned, with what Max doing now, um, is important because there has to be guys that bridge that gap and take it to the next level. And I, I think in terms of long term effect, maybe not directly from him, but on the teams he played and what he was able to do when he was at Carolina probably had a long-term effect. And yeah. let me Go add, ahead. his you know, his three years, his lowest single season scoring average was his senior year. But oh, that's wow. also the team that won the ACC and got to the Final Four. Mm -hmm. So he was a Dean Smith guy. You know, mm -hmm. Dean Dean was asked when people used to say, well, Dean Smith's the only guy who can hold Michael Jordan under 20 points a game. Well, that's not true. Jordan averaged 20 points a game his sophomore year. But Dean was like, you know, find me a guy who scores 25 points a game. Give me a guy who scores 25 points a game, five others that want to play with him. Mm -hmm. Well, when Lewis's first couple of years, Dean needed a guy to score in a prolific way that he did. But that senior year, he was at 18.5. He had a lot of other talent. Some of the greatest players in program history were part of that era. And he didn't have to score as much. He bought into the team and the team achieved. So yeah. he was a Dean. He wasn't just a prolific scorer. He was a Dean Smith guy. And because a, a, a highly accomplished player like him bought into it, bought into the Dean Smith way, the Carolina way, which was the Dean Smith way, that helped lay the foundation for everybody that followed to buy into it. 100%. Yeah, great points right there, AJ. Let's move on to number 12 on this list, taking it way back to the to the roaring 20s in this one. Jack Cobb, a guard slash forward that played at Carolina from 1923 to 1926. Now, I'm not going to act like I'm a Jack Cobb expert. I don't think anybody watching this podcast is a Jack Cobb expert, but hold on tight because when you hear what he did at Carolina, you're, you'll understand why he's on this list and why he had to be on here. National Player of the Year in 26 pretty good three-time all-american in 24 25 and 26 that's pretty impressive once again three-time all-southern conference in 24 25 26 patterson medal award winner helms foundation hall of fame and not only is his jersey honored at carolina it's retired by the university so i know it's a long time ago and this is something we've dealt with with you know people kind of maybe not really, you know, something we, this is what we welcome when you when you do a list like this. You're gonna have people that disagree. That's fine. Absolutely. You know, that, it comes I, with the I territory it. and we like it. We don't want people to just agree with everything we say. Mm. Now, one of the things that I think, and I, and I can understand this in some ways, when people see players who played that long ago, I think, and we've talked about this on the last podcast as well, they kind of discredit them because it was so long ago and you know, yeah. it, it, just a whole nother world. Um, but when you look at what he did and and, and you just for instance, if Jack Cobb played in 91 and did what he did here, National Player of the Year, three-time All-American, three-time All-Conference, Jersey retired, he's on this list. So it can't be discredited just because he played, you know, 90, 80, 90 years ago what he did. He was one of the best players of his era at the time. I mean, you don't rack up all those things and get your jersey retired by the university if, if you're not a damn good basketball player. So no, no surprises for me while Jack Cobb's on this list, but – that is something that we've seen from a, a lot of Carolina fans that maybe, which we welcome. It, 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 I understand why they do it, but it's definitely something we've heard from, you know, just people in that era way, way back in the, in the day. If a few points are really important here. Number one, Jack Cobb couldn't control when he played. It's a great right? point. He was born, played that era. And he can't just put a pause in your life. And I'm like, wait, 70 years. Yeah. And so I could prove I could play in that era to appease people. Tom uh, Trapp, list yeah. done in 2021. Okay. He had no control of the area he played. It, it's not fair for people to say, well, he wouldn't be a good player now. Because we don't know. Nobody saw him play. And training and all that kind of stuff is different. He could still be a great player now. We don't know. The third thing, Jacob, is as long as the University of North Carolina has the banner hanging up there, the name hanging, the jersey hanging up there, and he's on the front row, and it's retired, 
then we have to include these guys. If you have your jersey retired and you play basketball at North Carolina, you must be on a list like this. You can't ignore that. Now, if North Carolina makes an announcement in a year from now and they're pulling down the jerseys of the guys that played, let's say, pre-World War II or something like that, or pre-1957 or whatever it is, because there are people that they have concerns about older guys getting ranked in here, guys that played in certain areas because the competition was different, that kind of thing. I get all that. But until North Carolina pulls Cobb's jersey down and George Glamick's jersey down and, and, and Jim Jordan's jersey down and so on, we have to either include guys like that on this list or consider them for these lists because yeah, they, I think with it, I think one of the really fascinating things about North Carolina basketball history is if you go up to the point the day before Dean Smith was hired, there was some stuff there. Yeah. Right. The 46 team played for the national title under a different coach. 57 team went undefeated. The two teams with 32 and 0 in college basketball winning national titles. 57 Carolina, 76 Indiana. Greatest records of a national champion ever. Both of them share that. A lot of stuff happened before Dean Smith arrived. North Carolina basketball isn't just Dean Smith and Roy Williams. No. It's a lot more. So a guy like Jack Cobb, who, by the way, won a national, was, was leading scoring the national championship team in 24 and was a national player of the year two years later, you can't ignore that. I never saw him play. There's no video of him. There are very limited stats. There's scoring averages. And teams scored a lot less back then. But we have to go by the fact that if – North Carolina basketball, the minds of Dean Smith and Roy Williams and all the people that have been in that program think that that jersey should be hanging in the front row up there. That's good enough for me, man. Yeah, I agree. And like I, I kind of said, you know, it, it, take away the, the time error that he played because you can't control that. If you would have considered Jack Cobb and what he accomplished, in, it, it, but you replaced it with 77 through 81, for instance, in the years he was there then you probably have no argument that he's on this list. I mean, he, he, national player of the year. I mean, he just did everything he could possibly do as a college basketball player. So yeah, I, I get, we get the arguments. Definitely. I mean, I can understand it in some ways, but like you said, if and when and until Carolina, which I don't think is ever going to happen, decides to rip down those jerseys, we can't just ignore these guys and act like they never existed. So, And, and also, and the next guy that's on this list didn't win a National Player of Year award or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Because it's a subjective list, we can use whatever criteria we want. And the mm -hmm. great thing about it is we're not putting a flag in the soil saying, okay, this is the absolute list. And Nobody can argue this. We don't want to. It's all for fun. It's only based on their UNC careers. And we also do take an error a little bit in consideration. That's why Glamick is at 14 and Cobb is at 12. A little bit is taken into consideration because we didn't have the privilege of seeing them. We didn't have the privilege of seeing the accumulation of all their different stats. You know, there, were, there was no tournament. There was a Southern Conference tournament uh, back when Jack Cobb played, but there was no NCAA tournament until 1939. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, we can't take liberty and say, yeah, but this guy was so good. He's just going to go ahead and be one spot above him because we know more. We have more to evaluate them on. So, you know, the, there, there's a detriment to having played almost 100 years ago. Yeah. There's also a positive winning all those awards. So we throw it into the pot, mix it up, do a little evaluation, and this is what we come up with. with, with the uh, Exactly. List. Exactly. We're definitely not planting the flag here. Let's move on to number 11 on this list, Al Wood. A Ford that played at Carolina from 1977 to 1981. First team All American in 81, All American in 1980 as well. NCA West Region MVP in 81, three time All ACC player, All ACC tournament team, 79, 80, and 81. First team All ACC tournament team in 81. And his UNC jersey is honored at the Smith Center. AJ, this is a little bit more in your wheelhouse because, like I said, I'm, I'm a young cat, so way before my time still. But from what I've learned about Al Wood, what I've run, read up on him, which I like to do when I kind of prepare for these videos and whatnot, I mean, you look at the list of accolades there, and this is – I feel like we've hit on a, a number of players on this list that were kind of maybe in the late 70s, mid 70s, early 70s, early 80s. I feel like this is not the first guy. We've still got a couple more coming up. Yeah. It just seems like it was a great era for Carolina basketball and just had some really, really big-time players. And, and Al Wood's another example of – accomplishing just about as much as you can accomplish maybe barring being the national player of the year in his time at Carolina. I mean, the guy got it done in, in terms of all ACC, in terms of all American, in terms of what he did in the NCAA tournament. I mean, this guy, Al Wood was a guy that, that was a, a really, really good player for the Tar Heels. I think you can argue that he's the most underrated player in Carolina history from, mm -hmm. if you, if you go to the Smith center or, or stand outside, just ask people coming in, 
you know, what, do you remember Al Wood? What did you tell me about Al Wood? A lot of people might not know, or they'll know very little, because he didn't have that National Player of the Year, ACC Player of the Year. He didn't have that one honor that just popped him into a different group. But he was so good. And, uh, you know, that 79, he was outstanding as a sophomore. 81, the run he had in the NCAA tournament, you know, somebody was talking to me about Marcus Page and the shot he hit against Villanova the other day, or earlier today, excuse me. And I said, well, okay, what about what Al Wood did in the entire 81 NCAA tournament? He averaged 21.8 points a game in the tournament. And, and his performance in the Final Four against Virginia is historic, and it needs to be carved out and placed over here. If you're going to take 10 performances in Carolina basketball history, you don't need to wait till the end of that list to get to out what Al Wood did against Virginia in the 1981 Final Four. It scored 37 points, scored 17 straight points in the second half of one stretch, and did it with jumpers, with drives, posting, floaters in the lane, getting the line, getting guys in foul trouble. He was a phenomenally consistent player, efficient player. He wasn't a guy that was going to go back door, slam the ball, scream, pound his chest or anything like that. So he didn't do a lot of stuff to draw extra attention to himself. He just went out there and played. And that was sort of the hallmark of those Carolina teams. When you think about guys like Mike O'Corn in that era, and you think about Al, obviously Al Wood, right at the end of the, of the Phil Ford era, that was the group that were, they were almost the perfect Dean Smith teams. He played 10 guys, 11 guys. Every time there was a dead timeout, they would run to the bench. I mean, that would, to me, when you go back and look at Carolina basketball, Dean Smith basketball, those guys lived it and breathed it perhaps more than any other era. And I was already talking about Bobby Lewis. That launched everybody into that stuff. But that Al Wood era, they completely believed it and bought it and lived it every day. And Al Wood was able to do that while also racking up a ton of amazing numbers and accomplishments. He put them on, the, on his back in 81 when they got to the title game. They uh, lost to Indiana. Isaiah Thomas had an incredible run himself. That was, uh, what, six hours after President Reagan was shot. The game was almost not played. Mm-hmm. In fact, the con- that was the last year of the consolation game in the Final Four. Believe it or not, wow. Indiana beat LSU, Carolina beat Virginia. Virginia and LSU were playing. They played a game Monday night for third place, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And when they were playing, I think when the game started, Reagan may have still been in surgery. Oh, wow. And we weren't sure if he was going to make it. They weren't sure the national title game was going to be played that night. Yeah. And they found out sometime, I guess, during that game, okay, he's going to be okay. And he went ahead and played the national championship game that night. And uh, so, you know, Carolina, in Indiana basketball history, that's a great day. But it was also a day your president was shot, so it's kind of a weird game yeah, historically. So uh, Al Alwood was such a fantastic player, underappreciated. If he played today, fans would be gushing all over him. He would be such an appreciated player. 100%, yeah. 37 points in a Final Four game. 17, 17 straight. straight. You talk about a guy putting the team on, the, on his back. That's He got had help, but the next guy we talk about uh, played, played a role that afternoon in the spectrum. It was a, it was like a three o'clock game in the spectrum in Philadelphia in 1981. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, well, that's a great segue to the next guy we're going to talk about, which I think there's a, a handful of guys that if you're a Carolina fan at any age, you probably have heard the name at least. I think there's some guys that if you're a younger Carolina fan, you maybe have never heard of. Um, but this is a guy that's on that list for me. Sam Perkins, a center at played at nights from 1980 to 19. 19- 84. Now hold on tight guys. Cause this list is long and, and it's some of these that are coming up next as well are going to get even longer. Three time, first team, all American three time, first team, all ACC ACC tournament MVP in 81 ACC rookie of the year in 81 USA basketball male athlete of the year in 84 first team, all ACC tournament team, 1981 and 82 NABC hall of famer inducted in 2018 Named to the <clears throat> ACC's 50th anniversary team in his UNC jersey is honored in the Smith Center. Now, now this era of Carolina basketball from 80 to 84 is one that a lot of us know because of what was accomplished, you know, during that 82 season and obviously what Jordan was able to do in those years. So Perkins was a guy that played with Jordan. But Sam Perkins is a guy, like I mentioned earlier, he's kind of on that list of, okay, if you're a Carolina fan, you've heard the name. You, you might not know a ton about him because he, you know, played in the 80s if you're a younger person but you know the name and you know how good he was as a player and man you talk about an impressive list I've ran through a lot 
not to mention, you, you know, got, got a ring as well. Sam Perkins, just one of the best to ever do it at Carolina. And I guess that's why he's just, I guess, right on the cusp of that top 10 at number 10. Well, he is number 10. Yeah. Uh, third all time at Carolina scoring second all time in rebounding, third in blocks, two national title games uh, in, I was just talking about the game against Virginia. He held Ralph Sampson to 11 points in the final four. That was Sampson's sophomore year. So and Sampson was some people's national player of the year that year. Oh, now he wasn't alone in guarding him, but he played a big part and Sampson was scoring 11 points. So it's been, you know, they needed Al Woods 37. They needed 17 straight, but they also needed Perkins. Now Perkins played in four Final four games, two semifinals, two national title games, averaged 14.3 points, shot 63.6%, averaged eight and a half rebounds, and had that game again. And also the next year, Elijah won. In 82, he went up against Elijah won in the final four uh, against Houston. You know, in 82 title game, you had Patrick Ewing. Now Ewing had a really good game, but Carolina still won. So uh, Perkins, it, 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 there was a, a line in Sports Illustrated. Some people called him Sleepy Sam, Silent Sam, whatever. He was he was not a demonstrative guy. He was again not a chess banger. He was a very fluid guy who who was always quicker than he appeared. That's why he had so much success, right? So, uh, Sports Illustrated wrote about him sometime in the '82 season, maybe after they won the title, that Sam Perkins quote looks like he missed life's wake up call. I think that guy, he was so deceptive, even to guys that guarded him, that he, ha he had the ability to step out and shoot. In the 83 season, the ACC experimented with a three-point line, 17 feet, nine inches, by the way. Perkins was hitting threes. He would put the ball on the floor, he'd drive in, he'd loft it off the glass, he'd score. He, could, he had that jump hook, left-handed jump hook. Uh, he could catch and shoot in the middle of the lane. He could do pretty much everything. Very fluid player, very good defensively, very, very smart player. Guy who had a lot of other interests in life uh, as well. He was a very interesting uh, player. His whole recruitment, how Dean Smith was able to promise his grandma that you know, he would go to church and all that kind of stuff, got him in Chapel Hill. Uh, unbelievable player. He doesn't have that major, major award, ACC Player of the Year, National Player of the Year, because he played with Worthy and Jordan at a time when Ralph Sampson was at Virginia. It's wasn't going to happen. And you can look at that period maybe be in the heyday of ACC basketball in many respects. Um, some people will, will do that. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. But Perkins was an unbelievable. That 82 team had Jordan Perkins worthy in the starting line. Then had Matt Doherty, who later became the head coach, and Jimmy Black, who was one of the more perfect uh, Dean Smith point guards. He wasn't Phil Ford, obviously, but he was – an extension of Dean on the court, very smart guy, knew exactly where to get the ball. He's the one who skipped pass yep. over to Jordan. Jordan caught it and hit the 17-footer, 18-footer, whatever it was, uh, basically to, to defeat Georgetown. So if you don't know, if you're a Carolina basketball fan, you don't know who Sam Perkins is, you haven't been paying attention. Shame yeah. Yeah, go do some research on that one. Go look into the history a little bit because, yeah, even really anybody on this top ten now, I mean, if you're a diehard Carolina basketball fan, you, you've probably at least heard the name. And if not, it's fun to go look at and research. Go So go look into the history of some of these guys after this video is done because we're only hitting on, you know, the surface level of what these guys did at Carolina and obviously what they went on, some of these guys went on to do in the NBA. Number nine, Billy Cunningham, a forward that played from 62 to 65, another name that I think is synonymous with Carolina basketball. And if, if you hear it, you know, two-time All-American, 64-65, ACC player of the year in 65, three-time first-team All-ACC player, named to the ACC's 50th anniversary team, inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame as a player in 86, another guy that made the NABC Hall of Fame as a player in 86 as well. And his jersey is honored in the Smith Center. AJ, Billy Cunningham, great player for the Tar Heels, did it back in that era of kind of the, the 60s era of Carolina basketball. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, I'm not a Billy Cunningham expert by any means. But when you talk about a guy that, that did it, accomplished just about anything you can accomplish, like so many of these guys on the list, uh, no surprise that Billy Cunningham is in this top ten here at number nine. The kangaroo kid. Yep, I, that's that's the best nickname on the list. I mean, that that's number one. If we were doing well, nicknames, he's number one. Look but, at the yeah. photo that we use for his bio piece. It's you know mm -hmm. he's up in the air. I mean, just a great athlete. Uh, here's a guy who could score and rebound with the best of them. Uh, you know, 
some people from a from a standpoint of how prolific he was about this bad era is some people say he's the greatest that Carolina ever had. Now you got to consider the era, uh, the fact that the Tar Heels were in that transition period. He's the one who pulled the hanging D, the Dean Smith uh, burning an effigy hanging. He pulled that from from the tree. Uh, Peter Gammons, I alluded to him earlier, was actually a student reporter for the Daily Tar Heel, chronicled that, mm. and has talked about it a lot. He's the arguably the great one of the greatest baseball writers of all time. Uh, Billy Cunningham could absolutely fill it up and grab every missed shot that, that seemingly grab every missed shot. Let's look at it this way. Um, he has the fifth, seventh, and ninth season, uh, best season scoring averages in Carolina history. Okay. He had a stretch of 40 straight games with a double double. He has 60 double doubles in his career. Those are Carolina straight records games. by far. 40 straight games. Uh, and, if, and, you know, this is, this series is based solely on Carolina stuff, but. Look at what Billy Cunningham accomplished after he left Carolina. When he was inducted into these Hall of Fames, they note as a player because he was a great player. It's also it was a great coach with the Sixers. It was a great player at the professional level. There are statues of him out there. There are other cities that lay claim to him as well. But his Carolina career was just off the charts. And I will never forget, Jacob, and this, this group that we're talking about this week in this video, I actually never covered any of these guys. They're way before my time. But the the media entrance used to be at the Smith Center where the office is. You know, when we go down to do a way, yep. or when I was a coach, when before COVID, the door we would go through, the main door of the office, mm -hmm. where the Dean Smith bust is, to yep. go downstairs to do the go to the press room and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That's where media used to enter. And I'll never forget entering one time. I'm going through there, checking my uh, bag and that kind of stuff. And behind me walks up the crowd of people with Billy Cunningham. I actually don't, to that moment, and never recalled seeing him in person before. And except maybe when he was coaching the Sixers, I may have gone to see the Sixers play the Bulls or something like that. But he walks in and everybody that was there, the ushers, you know, wearing the yellow shirts, all the people working there looked up and their oh, eyes oh were gosh. popping out of their head. <laughs> now, this I just is, saw a ghost or something, yeah. This is around 2003, 2004, okay? So you're talking, he's 30 years removed. 40 years removed at that God, still 40 years even then removed yeah. from from being the great kangaroo kid and people's eyes were popping out of his head and I thought man that's Billy Cunningham and, and I as a younger guy I remembered him with his professional stuff and coaching the Sixers and even playing a little bit but not as Carolina but their eyes were popping out because of the Carolina mm -hmm. they didn't give a crap about the Sixers leading them to a title sweeping the Lakers in 83 or anything like that it was those were Carolina blue eyeballs popping out. I, oh, that has always stuck with me about the kangaroo kid. That's a that's a great story right there. And yeah, like they've seen a ghost or something like that, just in awe yeah. of what yeah. they've seen right there. That's and he that's just had this cool to Jacob. Yeah, there's a picture out there if you Google him. He's wearing his letter sweater. Oh, God. It's like the, it's like that image of Choo Choo when you go to the football games and they play that little montage and Choo Choo walking toward the camera, wearing his letter sweater. It's just oozing a coolness, right? Yeah. But Billy Cunningham oozed the coolness. And when I saw him there, he had it then. And yeah, never he, lose it. Nah, he just, he just, that's a cool dude, man. That, wherever, the place to be is wherever he is. Wherever Billy, wherever the, I mean, if your nickname's the kangaroo kid, I mean, come on, you gotta be somewhat cool. I mean, that's that's one of the greatest really nicknames cool. of all time, much less in Carolina history. I mean, that's yeah. that's one of the greatest in my opinion. So yeah. Billy, Billy Cunningham, the kangaroo kid, number nine on this list. I mean, if you know, if you watch Carolina basketball during that era, you know how good he was and obviously what he Absolutely. went on to do to after his time as a Tar Heel. Last one on this list, AJ, coming in at number eight, James Worthy, big game James, a forward that played at Carolina from 1979 to 1982. Another name that you know, and even if you're not a Carolina fan, if you're just a basketball fan, you probably know this name. And this, I will say, based on my notes I'm looking at right here, is the longest list I've done so far. So hold on tight for this one because this one get, this one could go for a second. National Player of the Year in 82. Final Four, Most Outstanding Player in 82. NCAA East Regional MVP in 1982. Two-time first-team All-American, two-time All-ACC player. NCAA All-Regional Team in 81-82. ACC Tournament MVP in 82. All-ACC Tournament Team in 81-82. ACC Male Athlete of the Year in 1982, which I think we all know what happened during the 82 season, named to the ACC, ACC's, excuse me, 50th anniversary team, Naismith Hall of Famer, inducted in 2003 
And his jersey, number 52, is not only honored by Carolina, but another guy that is retired by the university. So we won't be seeing any number 52s anytime soon in a Carolina uniform. But, man, I don't even know where to start with James Worthy. Besides what he went on to do, obviously, with the Lakers and, and during his NBA career and just how successful he was on those teams, what he was able to do at Carolina, what, how good of a player he was, the teams that he played on, the guys that he played alongside, Michael Jordan, uh, Sam Perkins, like we've talked about. I mean, James Worthy is not only one of the greatest Carolina basketball players of all time, but one of the greatest basketball players of all time for what he was able to do in the NBA. So, yeah, big game James on this list at number eight. Got to be here somewhere, right? Yeah, he made the NBA's greatest 50 list. Uh, yeah. Matt Doherty told me when Matt Doherty was head coach at Carolina, he told me one time about, about James Worthy. He said he had the greatest fingertips of anybody he played with. That is, if you can remember, for those of you who saw James play, think about him getting the ball on the block, turning into the middle of the lane, and just letting a soft little flutter get mm -hmm. over the reach of a big man who was there. Great fingertips. Catching the ball on the break, going up, flushing. You know, that was right after, that was around the time when Louisville and, and uh, all their dunking and stuff and mm -hmm. Dr. Duncanstein, Daryl Griffith at Louisville, they played in the title game in 80 and then five slam a jammer with, with Houston and all their dunking and stuff like Great that. Nickname. Nobody could flush better than James. James, there's a video, you can find it if you Google it, on the break. I don't remember who passed him the ball. I'd have to, I haven't seen the video in a long time, but where are they filling the lane? Power four, forwards didn't power forwards didn't fill the lane back then mm. like they do now. And James Worthy filled the lane beautifully, catching the ball. I, I don't know if he dribbled or not. Two, you know, step and a half, whatever, go up and just flush in traffic. He was fearless. Um, he he wasn't overly demonstrative, but he did things in a way that were demonstrative. That 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 made you, you know, when James Worthy would dunk in traffic or if you were score or if you do it. The, maybe the greatest drop step in Carolina history or spin move rather, excuse me, to, and score guys felt, felt helpless. They felt powerless. They couldn't stop it. He was that good. And I'll tell you what, the accolades that you just read off, there would have been more had he not broken his foot his freshman year. He didn't play mm -hmm. 14 games. He was well on his way to being, you know, our, maybe ACC freshman of the year that year. Certainly uh, the all freshman team is averaging 12 and a half points and seven and a half rebounds when he broke his foot and didn't play the rest of the year. And that 80 team kind of petered out a little bit toward the end. But 81, they played the national title game. 82, they win the national championship. James Worthy was, uh, was a gangbusters kind of player. There was one motor, and the motor never let up. And then, of course, you had that other guy. And we remember the great Roy Williams comment about MJ during that documentary that ESPN did last year when he said he never freaking yeah, turned it off. off. Yeah. Well, Worthy didn't turn it off either. Uh, Jordan was more talented. We saw what ended up happening, but man, Worthy was absolutely phenomenal. The perfect complement to Jordan and Perkins. That 82 team with those three, there's never been a better threesome on a team in ACC history. Mm -hmm. It's obviously the best in Carolina history. Just, a, you know, you pick your poison. You got to determine ahead of time what hill you chose to die on when you played Carolina that night. It was either the Perkins Hill, the Worthy Hill, or the Jordan Hill. Yeah. And Jordan was a freshman back then, but he was still very, very good at times. Oh, yeah. And the complimentary guy, what, what Doherty was able to do on that team, and obviously Jimmy Black, who I talked about a few minutes ago, the perfect Dean Smith starting five. And yeah. Worthy, Worthy, Worthy was its engine that year. Mm -hmm. Just such a great player. And, 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 and even if you're not a Carolina fan, you know the name James Worthy. And, yeah, just crazy to think that Perkins Worthy and, and MJ were on the team at the same time and won a national he, title. It's he's the great. only guy on this list that I actually ever interviewed. I interviewed him in oh, 2016 no. in D.C. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, every year the ACC tournament has their legends and every school has, has a guy that represents them. I believe it was in D.C. in 16. He was the ACC legend. I had a really fun interview with him. And, again, Coach Smith, Coach Smith, Coach Smith. You know, I did Antoine Jamison was one year, Coach Smith, Coach Smith, Coach Smith. Roy never called Dean Dean. It's always Coach Smith, Coach. You know, the Coach Smith guys, <clears throat> they're just diff different. And I'm not saying that the Coach Williams guys weren't either. It's just a different era, different time. And uh, James Worthy really is, is many accolades he had, just the, 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 the reverence for Coach Smith and the way he spoke. It's no wonder that he got everything out of his ability because that's what the Dean Smith guys generally did. 
100%. Good stuff, AJ. We're going to wrap that one up here. Did numbers 13 through 8 on this list. Obviously, the next video will be the last one we'll do. We'll be doing numbers 7 through the, 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 the countdown everybody's looking for at number one. Who's going to make number one on this list? As we mentioned last time there, guys, we'd like to hear your thoughts and conversations on this. If you're signed up for our premium message boards on tarhillillustrated.com, we're going to post this on there. Get your opinions in. Get get in the chat. We, we like to hear people kind of talking about it and kind of giving their thoughts on, on, on this list. So if you want to do that and you're not already signed up, take advantage of the promo. Use the promo code VISITS2021. Get free premium access through August 10th of this year. Just got to do it and sign up before July 1st, so the end of June. Yeah, go ahead, AJ. Yeah, the discussion on the message board about this list is phenomenal. Yeah. And the great thing is, is most people disagree – <laughs> with a couple of parts and i love that i want the engagement so okay. a lot of you guys watch it right now i'm sure you disagree that's fine my list isn't right your list isn't right my list isn't wrong your list wouldn't be wrong it's all for fun it's some memory lane stuff i love looking back at these guys and for some of the younger people it gives them a chance to learn more about the history of this incredible program 100 mm-hmm. it, it, it's fun it, it's been fun for me to just do it with you and, and research some of these guys and learn more about them as a younger guy just to, to learn about you can already know about the history but just to go more in depth about it and really learn about how good these guys were listen to your stories it, it's super interesting uh, for me so i'm really enjoying this as well but yeah go get involved on our premium message boards give it a chat and of course guys stay tuned for the next one and stay tuned for all the rest of the content we have coming on our YouTube channel and TarHillIllustrated.com. As always, guys, like, share, subscribe, turn that notification bell on as well so you can know when we upload a video. We'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys. Thanks.